Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our beer event. My name is Lori Nelson. I'm the president of the Richfield Chamber of Commerce. So pleased that you could all be here today at the beer event. Uh, many of you probably know that you, you've done this before, right? So beer doesn't actually stand for beer. We don't drink beer now except at our December event. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you'll be fine without it. Um, it does, in fact, stand for Bloomington, Edina, Eden Prairie, and Richfield. So it's the four combined chambers. Every quarter um, throughout the year, we have a program. Uh, each separate chamber hosts a program. And uh, one of the, the beer events are one of the benefits that come with your chamber membership. So I hope you all take advantage of that throughout the year. We hold these multi-chamber events several times as an added value to our members with the goal of expanding your network and connections within the business community. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Marie, Maureen scallon failer whatever your name is. <laughs> She's president of the Bloomington Chamber, yeah. <laughs> Last year she had knee surgery and she was yes. hobbling around, but uh, she, she's much more able this year. So we're happy to have her and she's going to be introducing today's speaker. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks. <laughs> I received an email from a member uh, this morning and apparently my email uh, that I had sent to him was in his clutter folder. And so he wanted me to know that I was in his clutter folder. And I said, well, well, that's very nice because I've been called worse. I've ended up in trash, I'm in junk. So anyways, um, anyways, well, welcome. Welcome to all of you here today. We're really pleased that we can be here and bring all of our chambers together. This is a very strong program amongst the four chambers of commerce. Um, again, I'm Maureen scallon Failer, and I'm president at the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. And I get the uh, pleasure to introduce our, our speaker here today, and it really is an honor to be able to introduce Charlie. Um, it's going to be brief, Charlie. I could have talked for a while, but you know, we'll go, to, we'll go with the abridged version. So Charlie Weaver is executive director of the Minnesota Business Partnership a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy organization that makes up of approximately 115 chief executive officers representing Minnesota's leading um, employers. Prior to joining the partnership on November 17, 2003, oh, so you've, you have some time now, Charlie. Uh, Charlie served as Chief of Staff for Governor Tim Pawlenty, where he, among other things, coordinated the legislative strategy to implement the governor's agenda. He has also held positions as Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, led Minnesota's Office of Homeland Security, and served as a criminal prosecutor in Anoka County. His public service career started with his election in 1988 to the Minnesota House of Representatives where he served until 1998 as Assistant Minority Leader. Help me welcome Charlie Weaver. Thanks very much for that um, very nice kind introduction, although Laura, you totally misled me when you invited me. She said, come to the beer reception. It's like, I'm from Anoka, we never say no to beer, right, ever. So, but I'm really glad to be here. Um, and what Lori suggested we talk about is a little bit about the session, kind of what happened, what didn't happen, what's yet to come, right? Who knows? And then I really want to talk about business and how do we kind of respond to this constant drumbeat of anti-business rhetoric that we're facing across the, really across the whole country. Um, because if we don't, if we as business owners don't respond and aren't able to talk about why business is important, we're going to get run over. And we're seeing it happen uh, time and time again now. So we'll have some fun too. If my video works, it'll be awesome. Uh, I also want to recognize Ernie Lindstrom, an old friend of my family, a uh, great friend of my mother and father. My dad served in the legislature with Ernie, and Ernie represented the kind of legislator that we all want to have in Minnesota, a statesman thoughtful, smart. Uh, in his era, they passed remarkable legislation, both sides of the aisle working together. They still fought like cats and dogs, right, Ernie? They still fought like crazy, but at the end of the day, they got things done. And that is a talent that is uh, less frequent these days. So I want to recognize Ernie. He is an awesome leader for Minnesota. <clears throat> 
So I wish we had more guys like you, Ernie. So let's get, jump right into it. A little bit about the partnership. We are, a, uh, as Ori said, a membership organization, a CEO-only organization, about 115 uh, members, 2 million employees worldwide, 400,000 in Minnesota. That tells you something right there, doesn't it, about a global economy? They've got 2 million employees, but only 400,000 are in the state. Cargill, for example, less than 5% of their workplace is in Minnesota. Less than 50% of their, their workforce is even in this country. So these are global companies, which is what we keep telling legislators. This is, we aren't competing with Sioux Falls anymore, right? 15 billion in wages, 13 billion in taxes. We keep trying to remind the legislators of that. Uh, and over 400 million in charitable contributions. These are the companies I work with. You all probably work with them. Um, and what, one thing we talk with legislators about is you may like to beat up on big corporations, those big bad corporations, but the fact of the matter is without these companies, small business doesn't exist, right? Where does Bachman send their flowers? They send them to congratulations and parties and all of, you know, all of us are working together. These companies, while well, you may like to beat up on big companies, are the reason small companies exist. It's really, and, we can, and big companies can't exist without great small companies as well. But these are the companies that we work with. And a lot of people don't know that these companies account for 47% of all charitable giving. And that's an important factor we keep trying to remind legislators about, is that without these companies giving everything from clean air to clean water to parks to arts to theater to music, uh, the uh, United Way, these are the companies that give almost half of all those contributions. We're really blessed in Minnesota to have this many companies, Fortune 500 companies, second biggest in the country per capita here. And it's not just the public companies. We also have the largest private company in the country in Cargill here in Minnesota, as well as Carlson, although they were just half of Carlson was just purchased by a Chinese company, Holiday, Rosen, Schwanz. We don't think about the private companies as much, but these private companies are also really important. You don't hear about them, but they're important to Minnesota. So uh, let's talk about the session that just almost ended, right? Well, it did end, but they're going to come back. Uh, so going into the session, uh, kind of as we approached the last couple of weeks, these are the issues that were in play. Right? These are the issues we knew were going to be talked about. Tax relief, obviously, and small business tax relief was certainly something we were advocating for. The governor, for, the governor economic disparities was important. Transportation and transit probably foremost among everybody. Family medical leave was proposed, we'll talk more about that later. The surplus, the bonding bill, and from our perspective, preemption. Preemption is really important from our perspective because once you have Minneapolis on Friday is gonna pass a paid sick leave bill, six, six days mandatory paid sick leave. St. Paul's not far behind. If you saw the newspaper today, Duluth isn't far behind. So imagine if you're a company that's got employees like US Bank or Target, there's employees in all these towns, right? So Minneapolis passed the six days. St. Paul, maybe they'll pass eight days. Duluth, they could pass 10 days. You've got employees in every town. How in the world do you manage that from an HR perspective? It's a disaster. So we were really pushing hard on preemption. If you're gonna pass this, let's pass it at the statewide level, not in individual cities and towns. Let's do it statewide so at least everyone has the same rules and knows what's going on. That ultimately, we were not successful there, but we aren't giving up. We're trying to perhaps be able to make this part of a final deal if we can get it done. But those are the kind of things going in to session, and here's what happened. So the bad news first, no preemption, as I just mentioned, that's uh, gonna be a big problem for business, both small and large. No long-term transportation bill, although I think we got a shot still, although a slim shot at um, that in connection with the bonding bill that failed. Uh, in the last night of session. Universal pre-K, uh, which we don't like because it's just money sp spread all over to everybody. We like targeted scholarships that get to the kids who really need them in those challenged schools. Uh, that's not what happened. The governor prevailed on this. He likes universal pre-K, which goes everywhere. Uh, we think given the limited amount of money, we should target those, on, especially on kids of poverty. No solution on real ID, that's a problem. For Minnesota, for all of us who fly, that's a potential problem. Or just go into some federal buildings. <clears throat> and the statewide property tax automatic inflator we wanted to kill. Uh, that is something that automatically raises your property taxes as small business owners every single year. And it's just on autopilot. 
and it keeps going up. Uh, we at least wanted to get rid of that and freeze it. But we weren't successful. We did succeed in getting a small reduction for the first hundred thousand dollars of value of the biz of the of the building, but beyond that, uh, we weren't successful. So, bad news. Good news. We did prevent that 12 weeks paid family leave bill. That would have been very difficult for uh, Minnesotans to a business to live with. It was the most onerous bill in the country by far. There are a few other states that had uh, paid family leave, and I'll talk about that a little later, but this was the most aggressive. And the only one, by the way, that taxed business. In every other state where they've passed paid family leave, it's paid for by an employee payroll tax. In no other city or no other state do they ask employers to pay for that. In Minnesota, they did. Um, prevented uh, some other ta business tax increases that were there. We stopped um, efforts to stop you from participating in elections, as, as Chambers of Commerce, for example. They wanted to, to stop that. We'll talk about that later. Test scores, we like linking those to post-secondary results. We like parents. We think parents should be able to know when their kid takes an ACT or the Minnesota standardized test, they should know, does that mean they're prepared for college or not? And right now, you don't have any idea if you're a parent, your kid scores X on one of those tests, if they're ready for St. Cloud State or ready for Gustavus, they don't know. So this now will finally tell them, if your kid gets a 32 or whatever on a test, yeah, they're ready. Or if they're going to 28, you know, they really aren't prepared. They'll probably have to take um, classes at the university or at a, a St. Cloud State or UMD or St. Olaf in order to start the, the curriculum. So that should be helpful to parents at least. And maybe most important, pet owners can now establish trusts for their pets in Minnesota. For all of you who are worried about that, when you die, you can leave it all to Fido. And, oh, and they also, way to go house, pink, now hunting vests are legal, in or at least were proposed. Didn't pass, but the house passed it. So we got a shot. We can be like Wisconsin and use pink hunting vests. So um, what does this mean, this, this kind of uh, failure at the legislature? What does it mean for the elections that are coming up? Because clearly the elections were what were driving these legislators those last couple of days. Well, uh, at the top of the ticket, you've got the most popu unpopular candidates, not just like in the last five years, in the history of the world. Right? These are the most 60% of the people who plan to vote, find them unattractive and give them negative marks. That's unbelievable that you have 60% of the people on both sides of the aisle, right? It's not just Republicans who are worried about the Donald, uh, it's also the Democrats. So that's interesting. How will that affect turnout? Really the most important issue in an, an election, especially in Minnesota in a presidential year, is turnout. By far, that, that matters more than anything else. And how is this going to affect it? Nobody knows. Nobody knows if having Trump on the ticket is going to put a lot of people out and have them come out like it did with Jesse Ventura in Minnesota. People come out, they're mad, they're upset, they vote. Or is it the opposite, that people are just like, I can't vote for him. I'm just going to stay home. And the same on the Hillary side. I can't vote for her. I'm just going to stay home. And what does that mean when if people do one or the other? If you have a ton of people coming out, is that good? And you know, my gut tells me maybe that's okay for Republicans in rural Minnesota. Probably bad for Republicans in the suburbs. If, if, if women are coming out to vote against Trump in the suburbs, that's not good. But will they come out because they really don't like Hillary that much either? I mean, so you've got all these dynamics. I think right now nobody knows. What we do know is that everything we've thought about the Trump candidacy is wrong, right? Everything we thought is wrong. So I think anybody who says, I know it's how this is going to turn out, is not right. And what happens down ballot? If I were Eric Paulson, I'd be very worried about this. Right? People may come out and vote either way and then just go home. They may come out and vote for Trump and then go home. That's what they did with uh, Governor Ventura. If you look at the, the, the uh, results in the Ventura race, a lot of college kids came out and voted for Governor Ventura and then they went home. They didn't vote for, for down ballot elections that year at all. And that's a problem. If I'm running for the House or Senate, I'm worried about that. Um, it may, you may think it's a good thing, but it's probably not. Was this a do-nothing session? That, everyone's trying to spin it right now, right, today. Republicans are out on Highway 14 today saying, you know, the Democrats failed and therefore we aren't going to get the money for Highway 14. And the Democrats are doing the same thing. So at this point, they're all trying to blame each other. But if it's viewed as a do-nothing session, 
overall because we didn't get a lot of the things we talked about. And that plays right into the Trump um, theory of government, right? These guys, you elect these people, they spent four months there, and they got nothing done. That may translate perfectly into his theme in, in Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we probably aren't going to see much money spent here either, right? Because Hillary didn't win, and Trump, this is the only state in the country where Trump finished third. The only one. I was very proud of that. <laughs> very proud. <laughs> Go Rubio, right? Um, so, but so we aren't going to probably see a lot of, of money spent by either of those candidates here, because Hillary assumes probably correctly that she's got it locked up, at least at this point. So we aren't going to see a ton of advertising. That also affects how the down ballot folks will do. And since there's no statewide candidates, there's no, can there's no governor campaign, there's no Senate campaign this year in Minnesota, that means all the money that all these groups have on both sides will be pouring it into House and Senate races. So you're going to see spending. Last year in St. Cloud was one of the first million dollar house races. Million dollars spent for one house race. When I ran, used to run, I used to spend 20,000 tops. Ernie, you probably spent like a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> Last election, we spent $960. <laughs> 900. <laughs> Ernie spent $960 in your last election. And they spent a million bucks in St. Cloud last year. And this year, you're going to see more than that in these, in these House and Senate races because they've got a tons of money and they don't have to spend it on, a, on the governor or Senate. So that's kind of my sense of, the, of this most recent legislative session. We can talk more. And I do want to leave 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, we'll see how that shakes out in the whole transportation bill and the special session. I did want to add the Minneapolis mandates because that is coming, as I said, you all know what it says, paid sick and sick, uh, safe leave. They're going to vote on this tomorrow. They're going to take amendments. Friday, they're going to pass it. So this is a done deal. It's going to happen. It applies to any business with over six employees, and they have to provide it if your employee spends 80 hours a year in Minneapolis. So if I work for Bachman's and I'm delivering flowers downtown, and I spend 80 hours delivering flowers in very parts, various parts of Minneapolis, I'm covered. Nobody else is at Bachman's. I mean, imagine the headache of this. Or if I work for UPS, or I'm a, a lawyer who does a, you know, I, I, my office is in Bloomington, but I'm downtown all the time defending my clients, whatever. If it's 80 hours, you're covered. So this is a really uh, a significant problem, not just for Minneapolis businesses, but for anybody who has employees who even travel through Minneapolis. They passed this in Portland, and truck drivers now go around Portland. <laughs> so when they're going from Seattle to San Francisco, they go around Portland because they don't want to have those two hours or whatever it is to get through Portland. We're going to create that same kind of problem here in Minneapolis with this um, proposal. Our hope is that this language in the fourth bullet, employers with paid time off policies meeting or exceeding the ordinance don't need to do more than this. We hope, right now, it's, it's, it's pretty restrictive. In our view, if you've got PTO, right, which most of you probably have, which most employees want, you should be completely exempt from this. If you have six days or more PTO, you shouldn't have to worry about this at all. That's not how it's written. I mean, you have to have it exactly the way Minneapolis has written it, in terms of when you qualify, how often you qualify, how many hours do you have to work to get your PTO now, when does it start. If it's not exactly the same as this, then you won't get exempted. And, the, and at the end of the day, this hurts employees, right? Because if I have 10 hours PTO right now, and now I'm not covered, and I can't get exempted from this, well, now my employees are going to get four, four hours PTO and six hours of sick leave. So now they're going to have to have the slip, right? And they're going to have to show them that you went to the doctor, and blah, blah, blah. Employees will hate this. But it's part of the problem we'll talk about in the second half here. And, and you, you have to maintain the records, by the way, for three years. Even if you don't think you're exempted, if you got one person going to Minneapolis for 80 hours, you got to have those records because they can come back at you for three years. So that's a challenge. Even the Star Tribune doesn't like it. And then you got the minimum wage coming down the pike, too. That's going to be on the ballot this fall in Minneapolis. They're going to pass it. My guess is they'll pass it. The city council, they review it and they decide if it's constitutional. In my view, it's not constitutional because the state's already set a minimum wage statewide. And under the constitution, if the state has already occupied the field in a particular thing, cities can't go in and change that. That's the argument at least. And they're, 
Even the Minneapolis city attorney has told city council members, this may, we may not be able to do this even if it's on the ballot and passes. So keep an eye out for that though. That's, a that's why they keep talking about sick leave in the context of health, right? If, when you hear, listen to the mayor talk about the sick leave, she doesn't talk about it in terms of anything other than health because that is an exemption. They can do health and safety as a city and be exempt from the normal rule that if the state has already occupied the field, you can't do it. So that's why they talk about it that way. But this will be a challenge going forward. So uh, let's talk about kind of the, the impetus for a lot of these results that we're seeing at the legislature, and that's this anti-business rhetoric that is very strong, uh, and it's not just in Minnesota, it's elsewhere. So here's kind of the, the current message is this anti-business message that started really with the Occupy Wall Street movement back in 2011. You all remember that? Big campouts, things like Wall Street is bad, greed is bad, these guys don't treat their employees well. It's a coordinated effort, uh, and their priority is really around workplace mandates like I just talked about and expanding uh, the labor force, expanding the union membership. That's really the focus of it. And there was a recent Twin Cities business survey that surveyed businesses large and small in Minneapolis, and they asked them, what, what are you worried about? This was one of the number one things that the business community is worried about in Minnesota. They're thinking about this. How is this going to impact my business or my ability to stay and work in Minnesota? Who's behind it? Initially, it was a bunch of labor groups and activist groups, really, that were focused on this. The cast of characters in Minnesota include SEIU, 15 now, it's $15 minimum wage, <coughs> Alliance, AFSCME, the usual folks you'd expect to be pushing this. They're the groups that are really um, driving this. Are they effective? Yes, they're effective. If you look at what's happened in other states, Look at California, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, they have all passed family leave proposals, although as I said, none of them are as onerous as what was proposed in Minnesota. In those states, instead of 12 weeks paid leave, like Minnesota proposed, those states have passed six weeks paid leave, paid for by a purely employee uh, payroll tax. In Minnesota, as I said, it's 12 weeks paid for half and half. And then city mandates around minimum wage and sick leave. So this effort is working. It's really working, and you see it's working um, more and more all around the country. Why is it working? Now, well, let's see. Why is it working? Well, part of it is the caricature of the business leaders, right? I mean, it's so easy to demonize business these days. And frankly, sometimes, especially in the large companies, we bring it on ourselves. You know, you think some of the, the big businesses around the country who've gone bankrupt, who've, who've screwed their employees in the 401k, who've had problems. You think of those guys and as the bad guys, there are a few, just like in any uh, part of life, but it's easy to, to have this caricature. Even Hollywood, right? President of business, have you guys seen the Lego movie? I love the Lego movie, it's an awesome movie, but the bad guy is business, right? President of business is the bad guy in this. So it's, it really creeps into everything we're seeing across society. So what do they want? Uh, from really from business and all of us, the minimum wage I already mentioned, mandatory paid sick leave we're seeing in Minneapolis, mandatory paid family leave we talked about statewide, expanded access to overtime pay, and then fair scheduling. Fair scheduling, you all recall, this last fall in Minneapolis was brutal. 28 days, all of you would have had to give notice to your employees in scheduling them for their uh, in their work schedule. It's uh, insane, truly insane. Um, but it was something that, that the Minneapolis mayor embraced and council members supported and but for some hard work uh, it had a chance to pass. Why should you care about this really? I mean is this just something that's going to kind of come and go and you don't need to worry about it? Well we talked about the mandates already. The, it leads to uh, working hard not to get business involved in the political process. They're working at that. That's part of this. Opposition to business tax relief. Clearly this last session People were afraid to stand up on the floor and say, I support property tax relief for business. Republicans, Democrats, people we normally consider pro-business legislators were afraid to stand up and say, no, I'm from Bloomington, I'm from Edina, I'm from Richfield, and we, need, we support business. Business is good. It helps people live their lives. They were afraid to say that because of the, of the, of the blowback that we so often see. And even around education issues, um, we see the, the, the phrase corporate takeover of education. 
That's the phrase that the teachers union is using now, is corporate takeover. Like, so if they can somehow make any proposal around education fit business, that helps them. It helps them defeat whatever they're talking about, which is worrisome for sure. What does it look like in Minnesota in terms of the anti-business fight? This was a, a rally outside the state capitol. You probably can't read the signs. I love these rallies because the signs are really creative, right? The one I like here is, uh, let's see, screw with us. This one's over here, like right here. Screw with us and we multiply. <laughs> so I think that one says. <laughs> Just, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then you got the guy in the corner says, Governor Walker, America. What is he saying? Line, oh, line item or something. He's at the wrong state, right? But it's, it's like he thinks he's in Wisconsin, which is not atypical for Wisconsin people. Uh, you got the, uh, sorry, Beth McMullen is here and she's wants to work with me and she's from Wisconsin. Um, we saw this downtown, Occupy, kind of get the money out of politics, the marches in the city hall. Um, again, you can't silence the truth. Business silences our voices. I mean, that's the kind of, my right? business silences our voices. That kind of rhetoric, just pound and pound and pound, is, is having an impact, even for the people who support us at the Capitol. Free markets control people, controlled markets free people. Right? Scary, scary. Free markets control people. Control market, this is like, you know, Marx, Lenin kind of stuff. But they believe it. And then on the, on the House floor this last year, this is the kind of stuff that was being passed around. Uh, House Republican priorities, starving our schools and students while feeding corporate special interests. Seriously, starving our students and schools while feeding special interests. Uh, again, Another one, racial disparities on the left, it's something might be hard to read. Handouts to big business and the wealthiest corporations. It didn't happen, not truthful at all, but it's a great way to tee it up, right? Business is bad, we're against racial disparities. Um, these are just a couple of clips from the House. And all session, uh, we have seen the House Republican majority put corporate special interests ahead of Minnesotans. The Republicans are shoveling $5 billion of tax cuts to businesses, and these are not just small businesses. Reject this scheme to concentrate more political power in the hands of corporate special interests that clearly already have plenty. Whose side are you on? Those people just trying to put a roof over their head? Or those people trying to drive a BMW? That's, that's the rhetoric. And I, again, I don't mean to be overly partisan about this. Both sides of the aisle have embraced this. Uh, they're better at it. The, the, Paul Thiessen particularly good at it. But it's both sides that have embraced this kind of anti-business rhetoric. But that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing. So, and what do the polls say? This is having influence. Only 30% of Americans think what's good for business is good for society generally. That's, that's not good. Democrats and Democrats leading independents are likely to hold positive view of socialism as they are of capitalism. Equal, right? Equal footing. Only 19% of Americans ages 18 to 29 identified themselves as capitalists. Only 42 percent said they support capitalism. That should frighten all of us in this room. Right? It's the fundamental basis of our free economy and the success of this country. And yet, uh, only 42 said they support capitalism. So this is, the, this is the challenge that we face. So bottom line is, you got a growing number of people who don't believe that we all in this room are a force for good. Public is increasingly receptive to this anti-business, anti-capitalism message. Uh, and the rise of the value voter, we're seeing time and time again too, right? We just saw it with Target on the whole restroom issue. You know, that gets them embroiled on both sides of the aisle. Um, you see the Chick-fil-A in New York City, the governor's come out and saying, you know, no one should go to Chick-fil-A and eat Chick-fil-A because privately, personally, the owners of that are against gay rights or some social issue, right? So it's the mixing up of social issues into the private sector is something that's also um, something that's happening a lot. And social, um, corporate social responsibility is really important. And that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that corporate, corporations and businesses are socially responsible, but it's become the thing in a lot of ways as well. So how do you, do, how do you deal with this? Uh, 
clearly as a, as a business uh, people in the southern metro, you got to figure out how to humanize yourselves, localize, and mobilize. Those are kind of the three keys to kind of fighting back against this um, this tidal wave. Let me show you one. The BP um, British Petroleum launched this My Golf after the big spill. Right? It's a good example of what could be worse than that huge oil spill in the Gulf. There. You know, the likability of BP was at zero for much of the country and much of the world. So uh, what do they do about it? Look how they use the names of the people in some of these companies as well. specific names of the businesses. A great example of how you humanize, you got a big problem, humanize the issue. We need to figure out a better way to do that. Localize it. When the governor proposed a tax on business services back in 2013, it would have affected all of you in this room. It was the first in the country, it would have been the only state in the country that would have taxed business services. Uh, and we all fought back, right? The Chamber of Commerce, the Business Partnership, all the businesses group fought back and said, you know what? If you're a company in Minnesota, if you put the tax on our services and we're the only state in the country that has this, that makes all of us more expensive than all our competitors. It puts Minnesotans at a disadvantage to companies that are located in Wisconsin or Texas or Boston. That was a, a successful effort to defeat that was when we pointed out you're hurting Minnesotans. You're making put, putting Minnesotans in a worse position than every other, uh, all of our competitors. You're making, you're hurting General Mills uh, while Post is doing just fine, right? They're going to they're gonna take advantage of this. And you can use all those examples. Law firms, accounting firms, you name it. That was successful. So localizing your argument about why business matters uh, is important. Um, the real world consequences and ultimately the governor dropped that, um, dropped that proposal. These are some of the um, captions uh, in connection with that as well. Finally, and the governor dropped it, I think at the Twin West Chamber. It was kind of a surprise to everyone because he was working it hard. And then at the Twin West Chamber, he said, I'm dropping it. So good for him. See, chamber membership makes a difference. Mobilizing. Uh, is probably the third factor, getting involved, getting engaged, making a difference. You remember when they proposed the scheduling mandate last year, the fair scheduling, this 28-day notice? They didn't drop it because our CEOs got involved. That's not why they dropped it. They dropped it because Joe's Beer Garden got involved, right? And Bill's uh, um, parking lot um, renewal company did it. The snowplow guy who said, seriously? <laughs> I mean, I plow snow. I don't know the night before if I'm going to my guys are going to be working the next day, let alone 28 days. The bars are on the Twin Stadium. Twins make the playoff, we got to be ready to go. If Twins don't make the playoff, we're going to send them home. If it's cold, if it's start, you know, all these small businesses got together and educated the city council about why this is really bad policy and ultimately hurt my small business, and that's why that was defeated. It wasn't big business. It was small business gathering together telling their stories, and that's what works. Uh, humanizing it, localizing it, and then getting mobilized and getting out and talking to elected officials is what matters. I'm sure the mayors here would agree. You get a call from a constituent, right? Dogs barking, you're on it, right? Right away. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I remember when I served in the legislature, if I got 10 calls on an issue, that was like a landslide. People don't call legislators like you think. They, maybe they call mayors and city council. They do, okay? <laughs> She's like, I wish I only got 10 calls. Well, the legislative letter, they don't, they don't call state legislators that much. They just don't, unless it's on like a big issue like you know, gun control or something like that. But for most issues, if I get 10 calls from someone in my district on any issue, I'm paying attention. I pay attention always, hopefully. But 10 calls, it doesn't, mean, doesn't take much to get the attention of your elected official. So mobilizing uh, and getting people involved really makes a difference. And it, it worked there. We talked about the coalition. These were um, business owners who showed up and talked. Um, Sorry, we're closed. I love my jobs. I mean, you too can play at the, at the, uh, at the sign game, right, and be successful. 
The WFA jeopardizes my right to choose my profession. And that's, a, that's a great message, and it really did. It really did, and frankly, a lot of the people who showed up were waitresses and waiters who said, I love this profession. I like this profession because if I want to work a double shift, I can work a double shift. If my son is sick, I can go home. It's got the flexibility I want. So losing those jobs, and if you look at the businesses, especially the restaurants that have left Minneapolis in the last six months, it's a big problem. And St. Paul, instead of thinking of doing the same thing on the uh, sick leave, should be saying, we aren't going to do anything, come on, come on over to St. Paul. Um, because it does make a difference. Businesses can, uh, as, as you know, uh, can move. So finally, how do you talk about this stuff? How do you talk, when you're talking to a legislator, you're talking to your city council, you're talking to your mayor, how do you talk about it? Well, just a couple of thoughts on that. <clears throat> we did some work with Frank Lunds, probably you've seen uh, him, he's on a lot of the TV talk shows, interpreting data, he has focus groups, he talks about, he's written several books about words matter and what words should you use when you talk to people. Well, first understand, people trust businesses. Leaders who are voting trust businesses, especially small businesses, especially chamber member businesses. If you look at this, the first one, when it comes to balancing the budget, creating a healthy economy, who do you trust more? Overall, 35% say business owners or business leaders are most trustworthy, Democrats, Republicans, the governor, but then the key, the key is the swing people, right? The people who aren't that politically involved. The average person who's coming into your shop, that's the key person. 50% of them say, I trust Minnesota business leaders. I trust them. So don't assume, despite all everything we've talked about in terms of the challenges, Minnesota business leaders are trusted. And they're not only trusted by the general public, in polling of, uh, if you ask employees, who do you trust for fair information about an issue? They trust their employers. They trust their employers more than they trust Fox News, or more than they trust the internet, or more than they trust the Facebook friends, or more than they trust, they trust their employers. So we should use that. We should take advantage of the fact that they trust you um, to talk about problem solving. And how should we talk about it? What's the best reason to trust business leaders? They're problem and solution driven. So when you talk to them, we, sh we should phrase it that way. Let's, we've got this problem at 35 and 494, right? Let's solve this problem. Let's solve this problem. Let's figure out how to make it right for all of us, regardless of what the issue is. They uh, see the future and prepare for it. They're more accountable than Congress. They have a clear mission. They get things done. Those are all advantages that people see to working and listening to the business community. So we, that's how we should talk about it. Words do matter. So think about this when you're talking to elected officials at any level. Don't talk about innovative thinking, right? That's a business kind of word. Talk about real solutions, real solutions for Bloomington or Edina or Richfield, right? We want to propose real solutions, a realistic approach, not forward thinking. A plan of action. Action is an awesome word to use. Always, right? That's what you guys are. You're men and women of action. You've got a plan to fix something. Cost-effective idea, not cost-benefit analysis. So stay away from the, the business kind of sounding words and talk about it in words that real people understand and can talk about. That's what, that's what makes a difference. Uh, we tried to do, in the brochure you see in front of you is something we uh, handed out the legislature this last, the last two weeks of session because, again, we had this drumbeat Drumbeat, drumbeat, business is bad, corporations are bad, CEOs are bad, you guys don't care about your employees, blah, 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 blah. So we thought we better at least uh, put out something on the other side that shows, you know what, business is pretty darn good. In Minnesota, we are blessed. We're blessed with businesses that save lives. When you talk about St. Jude or Boston Scientific or Medtronic or 3M, we, we, we feed the world. When you talk about General Mills or Land O'Lakes or Cargill, they literally are feeding the world. Or we, we keep water clean in Africa when you talk about Pentair or Ecolab. I mean, these businesses are doing amazing things, not just in Minnesota, but around the world. Good things that save people's lives or feed them or keep them alive or get them stuff they want, right? A, a snowmobile or a four-wheeler. It's We are blessed in this community with these great businesses who do these great things. And we need to stand up for ourselves and let legislators know that. And we need to figure out a way also to uh, engage our employees on that. So I think um, John Mackey said it well, Whole Foods, and kind of addressing this whole issue 
for business. Um, you know, the myth that profit is the sole purpose of business has done big damage. He's talking about the whole approach to capitalism here. We need to recapture the narrative. That's what we're talking about and restore it to its true essence. The purpose of business is to improve the lives of people and create value for stockholders. That's why business exists, is to improve the lives of people. And Whole Foods is a good example of, if you do the polling around the country on companies, people love Whole Foods. They love Whole Foods, not because necessarily that the food is that great, but the way they talk about their company and the way they talk about giving back and the way they talk about what Whole Foods does for a healthy economy. He's hitting it on the head, and we all need to figure it out, a way to talk about this in the way that that um, John does. So, last slide. What should you do? What should we all do? Get engaged, right? Engage with your local chamber. You're all are obviously you're here, so you're involved in the chambers. The chambers can make a difference. The chambers in Minnesota are very effective. You're effective independently, but you're effective at a couple of meetings like this. We've got four of them together. Or the state chamber is very effective, and they do a great job for all of you as well. I got to put in a plug for Doug. He is doing a Doug Loon is doing a great job as well for the whole state. And if you got dis disagreements between you guys in the state, work it out. But at the end of the day, you got to come together, right? You can, we cannot be fractured as a business community in Minnesota. We need to figure out ways to work together. And I know all the we don't always agree. I'm sure between different chambers, sometimes maybe you're fighting each other on competing for different things. But at the end of the day, we need to be together, the business community working together. Spend time with your local officials. It makes a difference if you show up with the mayor, you show up with the legislator, have a cup of coffee. You'd be surprised uh, the difference that'll make. Tell your story. Tell your story to the local, uh, if there's an article on one side and you don't agree or you support it, don't be afraid to get engaged as a business committee. So often we're afraid to get engaged as business leaders because of the whole, well, your business so you must be a bad thing. Don't be afraid. If we don't stand up for ourselves, we aren't going to be uh, successful. And get your employees engaged. Well, that's one thing we've not done a great job at. I know a lot of businesses are scared to death, right, to engage their employees because they think they'll get accused of, oh my gosh, you know, uh, CEO sent me a note saying I should call my congressman on GMOs, right, or something. And he's just pushing his political agenda on me and I don't like that. And they rip the CEO for that. So you got to be careful. I understand why some businesses don't want to get their employees engaged. But I tell you what, if you're talking about a off-ramp on 494 and you're a company there that's going to help, you better get your employees engaged in that. And writing the mayor, writing the governor, writing your legislator. Don't be afraid when it's appropriate to engage your employees. They're a great resource and probably the most um, respected, the most trusted, the most reliable uh, deliverer of your message as well. So uh, that's my suggestion for that. So with that, uh, if you want, I can certainly answer questions or you can go have some beer. The microphone, the handheld, it's up here? Oh, sure. yes. Yeah, this will help. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Charlie, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming and, and giving that perspective of business. I'm known as a business-friendly mayor. But, you know, what I have also seen, and, and maybe you know of this too, is I've actually had an awful lot of rhetoric sent directly to me bashing unions and labor as well. So it's happening on both sides. Sure. How do we stop all of this and start sitting down and figuring out where we're how, and how to move forward? That's a, that is a great question. I think in, in the negative campaigning, you're right, it makes people crazy, yeah. but it won't stop until it doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. As long as negative campaigning works, they're gonna keep doing it. And unfortunately, so I mean, it really will take uh, an example where public officials running for office see a, a, a whiplash from that, right? If I rip someone and I lose because I've gone too far or I've attacked their family or whatever, that's what you need to stop that negative campaigning. And you're right, it's it's totally both sides. It's uh, on, on any number of issues, whether you're talking about social issues or guns or taxes or education, uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge. So, but first of all, we just gotta stop it from working. 
And that's, that's hard. Thank you for your work. And the question, I'm Aaron Colkman from Boulevard Wealth Management. We're based in Eden Prairie. We're part of the Eden Prairie Chamber. Uh, we have a number of clients uh, who are uh, private business owners and who are faced since 2013 with the idea that their business assets are part of their estate uh, in a state that has a very, very restrictive estate tax uh, at a very, very low threshold. So <clears throat> how can we fix this? How can I say to somebody who's my client, gee whiz, it's okay, you don't have to move your business assets out of Minnesota. And oh, by the way, if you move them out of Minnesota, you're not going to be sought after at your death just for having your cabin here. Right. Because you, you had, you, you know, something left in Minnesota, even if it was under the exemption amount. So how do we fix those issues? <clears throat> I'm at a total loss as to what to say to the person sitting across from me. I have absolutely no idea in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day battle. I don't even know where to start. That's a, a uh, great question, great point, and real problem. Unfortunately, um, the governor doesn't believe you. Uh, we, on the estate tax exemption, it was in the, the House bill this year, the House tax bill in conference committee. We pushed hard for that to get federal conformity, get up to 5.2 or 5.3, whatever it is. That would have made a big difference. Because, And again, that's a, that's a perception problem. People were afraid to address the estate tax issue, to bump it up to 5, match the federal level, because they thought they'd be tarred as being, well, you're just for those rich guys, right? And it's so easy to demagogue that and say, well, only rich people would have $5 million to leave their family. So it was really hard for anybody, either side of the aisle, to support that. But the fact of the matter is that affected farmers as much as anybody in the state. The inability to pass your farm on to your family was really limited by this crazy law and this low amount. So. Again, we have to be more successful in framing it up and how we talk about it. If you talk about it in the sense that, well, you know, people of means need to be able to, we're losing them because of this, that doesn't work. It's not good word choices. If we talk about farmers and the ability to pass on your state, that's, I think, the way to attack it. The other question about our income tax rate, which is now the second highest in the country for people making over 250,000, second highest in the country. And, but you saw a headline in Star Tribune two weeks ago, right? Income tax doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. There's no evidence that shows that, that uh, people are leaving Minnesota, businesses are leaving Minnesota because we have this extraordinarily high income tax. We, and I worked with that reporter, and I gave him the names of several people who've left Minnesota, costing the state millions of dollars, costing our nonprofits lots of money, even though you're not supposed to use that as a factor. Most accountants I know tell my members who leave the state, well, you better not give to the United Way in Minnesota. You better not give to the Guthrie. You better not give to the Walker. You better not give to the Boy Scouts. You better not give to any of these things in Minnesota because it's going to link you to Minnesota, like you said, right? If you have a cabin, that's, that's not so good either. So uh, we need to convince them that this does matter. And the problem with in, people who leave because of uh, the punitive tax environment here, don't talk about it. And frankly, you know what? If I left two years from now and some a reporter called and said, hey, did you leave because of those crazy high taxes in Minnesota? I'd say, I'm not talking to you because the Department of Revenue has got my name, right? <laughs> and I might be audited two years from now. So I'm not going to go on record and say, right? So that that's a challenge. We need to, uh, and the data, because of privacy rules, you really can't get the data to prove hey, John Smith left Minnesota because of this. And you know you, you just can't get to the individual data. So we're continuing to work that issue, but we need to per be persuasive that uh, at the legislature that it really does matter. We are losing businesses and people because of this onerous tax structure. But right now, they don't believe it. They do not believe it. And until 3M leaves, right? It's bad enough we just lost a couple, you know, half of Carlson companies. We lost Valspar. Um, I mean, that should give you some indication 
until some of those really high profile things happen, it'll be hard to convince people. As a follow up, thank you for that. You know, these are people who have their life's work in their entity or entities, and you're right, don't talk about it. But, but I guess my first question, listening to you, your response is, is there a way we can <laughs> talk about action to remove business assets from the conversation? Because it, th that takes somebody that is otherwise worth peanuts and puts them in this situation where their life's work is going to be handed over to the state. Right. And, and, and that is a reason to leave. Right. I think that if there was a way to do that, I think that's a good thing to, that's a good thing to explore. Is there a way to separate the assets from the in personal income, you mean? Yeah. Right. Just business assets. Right. Just say that's not, we're not going to deal with the farm, we're not going to deal with the private stock, we're going to deal with the personal life. Yeah. I think that's a good way to approach it. But you still need to convince them that, it's, that there's a problem. And that's, right now at least, that's a challenge. Charlie, thanks so much for <coughs> this presentation. It's really helpful. I wanted to ask, how much of a problem do you think it is that there are just very few elected officials who have experience running a business? Big problem, huge problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, encourage, uh, and both, the, the, you know, the Minnesota Chamber has worked hard to get members to run for office, right? Dave Baker over in Wilmer, small business owner, ran for office one, and thank God he's there, right? But when Ernie served, <clears throat> there were a lot more business people, people who actually, you know, balanced the checkbook, employed people, lawyers, whatever. They've actually had small businesses in the legislature. And right now, the trend is really against that. I mean, you make $32,000, $33,000 a year for a full-time full -time job, right? It's not fun. If you decide to run, they're going to go through your personal life. And you're going to get attacked, like you said, right, with negative ads. You're going to get that. So who wants to do this, right? And if you've got a small business, how in the world do you do both? How do you really show up? And we used to be able to have uh, farmers there, but right now it's you know it's mostly people who, you know, are community activists. They graduate the political science degree from McAllister, and they went straight to the legislature. That's not all of them, of course, but I mean. A lot of folks who've never had a job, never had, never worked at a factory, never had a small business, and that definitely taints their view of the world, for sure. And how do we, how do we fix it? Uh, I know I've told uh, our members, if an employee comes to you and says, I want to run for something, mayor, city council, school board, let them do it, right? Let them do it. Let them, let them go. If you're working for 3M, Lord knows you'd think you'd have a couple folks who they want to run for office, I encourage them to do it. Um, I'm not sure that happens all the time, even in our large companies. And we need to do a better job of encouraging them and supporting them, and not making it a financial nightmare to run for office. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I have a question. Is there a way that we could um, market to the, to the general public and remind them of all of the things that are great with our companies and uh, the benefit that uh, the entire population of Minnesota receives by having jobs and by having these businesses in here. I mean, just reading this piece, it would be like um, really a no-brainer to say, you know what, I do support business because business supports us. I, I sure wish we could. Um, you know, the challenge is, and, and those of you who market products, right, it's hard to market something where the public's already against you. You have to spend 10 times as much money. If the, if the, if the public's already with you, they like soap, right? Or they like Dove soap, and you're going to promote Dove soap, and it doesn't cost as much. But if you're going to convince them of something they already are mistrustful about, that business is good, corporations are good, it's, it would be uh, really expensive. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, and we are doing it uh, on the kind of the micro level in different Towns around the uh, different legislative districts around the state were driving that message that business, especially small business, local business, are really important to your economy. They uh, they give great jobs that allow people to have families and success, et cetera, et cetera, opportunity. Um, but the kind of effort you're talking about, kind of what uh, BP did, right, on the national level, if we could do that in Minnesota, uh, that would be great. 
Stan Hubbard keeps telling me we have to do that because he owns TV stations, right? <laughs> so he's like, you need to be on TV and talk about why business matters to Minnesota and why it is so important uh, to the success uh, and quality of life that we enjoy here in Minnesota. So we're, we're trying to figure that out, a successful way to do that. Um, it's really expensive, right, to do that. The paid me aside, so we're trying to figure out how can we do it other ways. But it's, it's a great point. And we're anxious. If you've got ideas, we'd love to embrace them. It starts in your chamber, really. It starts in your chamber. Uh, just a follow-up on your comment on the uh, TV ad from BP. Very, very nice. You also had a slide that said that uh, most of the uh, younger people are anti-business and anti-capitalist things, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't watch TV. <laughs> right. You're right. You know? <laughs> so very expensive TV ad. I wonder if those people watch it or not. Great point. Any other questions? You're right. You're right. And we, uh, you are all probably way ahead of, of us in social media. But clearly, I mean, one thing President Obama showed us in his last campaign was the effectiveness of social media, right? And how you can micro-target individual people in a specific precinct and you know what they had for breakfast and you know what their <laughs> magazines they read, right? And you know what clubs they go to and you know what kind of car they have and how much their house is and how much they gave to the politics. And we need to be better at social media and identifying and connecting with young people. You're right, because if, if, if we lose the millennials uh, on this issue of whether capitalism is good and business is good, uh, we're in for a rough few years. Because I'm counting on them to support me. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you all for giving me a Charlie, thank you for thank your you. excellent presentation. I'm happy to do it. Happy now to introduce oh, Pat McQueen, uh, president friend. of the Inquiry Chamber. He's got our closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, and again, thank you, Charlie. Uh, great presentation, and uh, support, we're a supporter of Southwest LRT, and I know all of our chambers very much supportive of transportation and everything you talked about, really. Um, just some final things uh, to mention as we get ready to adjourn today's great program. Uh, final thank yous to RBCU, Patrick's, Bachman's, Excel Energy, and Think Mutual Bank for their support of today's program. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it and found the lessons learned to be useful for your organization as you go back to your offices.